Quickly move the aileron, make sure everything's good. So these are your wing attachment bolts here. Same on this side. Guide wires are taunt. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Experimental Aircraft Channel. I'm Brian Wallstrom. Today we are in DeLand, Florida, visiting with Aero Adventure. We'll be talking about the Aventura line of aircraft coming up next. So if you could walk us through the uh, pre-flight process of an Aventura. Sure. Uh, so Brian, yeah, normally we start right up here in the very front. Uh, first thing I'd like to check, as a single pilot or dual pilot, we run ballast. To offset some of the, uh, the aft CG situations that you can encounter with the heavier engines in the back. So we come up front and open up this nose panel area, which gives us access to both our avionics compartment where we have all of our electrical stuff and then any ballast that we wouldn't want to be have placed in here. Of course okay. our batteries. So we're checking to make sure all our fuses are good, everything looks all right, and then the ballast is installed. And in this case it is. Now that we got this all secured, I like to make my way around. We'll start on the, obviously the left side of the aircraft and we'll make our way around back to the right and we'll end up right back where we started. So I like to come down here, check my, inspect my spindle housing. Uh, that's this area right here. This is obviously very critical for landing. Make sure there's no cracks or anything evident down here that I'm looking for um, and everything looks good. You know, a little bit of surface corrosion here from just being exposed to water the time that it has. And that could be dressed up pretty easily, but nothing compromised. Um, and then with the Behringer wheels and brakes being hydraulic, we want to make sure the safety wire is intact. That really holds your, your disc in place here. Um, it's between the tangs and everything looks good. Nothing's cracked. Um, and that'll give us the ability to make sure we can stop. So the wheel looks fine. Inspect the tire, make sure there's no nails, gouges, that it's not flat, so on and so forth. Everything looks good here. We'll make our way up. When we're looking at the bottom of the strut, it goes right into the bulkhead and this is critical because all of these are flight critical components. If any one of these breaks, you're going to lose your wing, in which case the BRS comes in real handy. But um, in this case, everything looks good. The hardware doesn't have any corrosion on it. There's no cracking. These plates are intact. And, we'll, and when we get to the end, we'll actually shake the wing to make sure that everything is still, um, nothing's loose in there as well. So we'll come make our way this way. We're just inspecting the strut, the wing itself. Everything looks good, hardware, everything's exposed, so we want to make sure we're able to, to look at it and inspect it, and everything looks still great. Uh, we turn on our wing bug. This gives us our ability to gather GPS data before we start moving. Um, the GPS is really there for when you want to plot your flight path and go back and review that data. So I like to have it on while I do the pre-flight just to allow time to, get, to gather that. Um, that gives me my redundancy from all of my air data um, in the cockpit. So coming back over, just inspecting, I like the feel, touch and feel. That way if there's any tears or if the fabric's compromised for any reason, you'll be able to start to feel the roughness on it. Um, and then like I said, on the back here, we'll lift the wing. You can actually shake the whole aircraft and everything feels solid. And that's what we want. We don't want any play. We don't want anything to come apart. So we want to have it come apart on the ground than in the air, obviously. So we come around, we'll check our aileron. We can actually physically move the aileron, make sure everything's good. When you pull it down, there's cotter pins in each one of these um, AN hardware, sorry. And we want to make sure that those are all still intact. And it looks like we're good to go on this one. Flaps, we can put those down electrically, but we want to make sure that it, there's no play in the flap. And right now it's very sturdy, which is what you want to see. So there's no play there. Uh, we'll check those when we're in the cockpit and we turn on our master, we'll be able to lower the flap. But similar concept, we're checking also for the cotter pins in each one of these connecting points. When we come down here, I like to open this up. And this gives us a very easy way to check um, everything that connects to your root tube, which is a central point because your engine is mounted to it as well as your wings. So these are your wing attachment bolts here, and then we have one right up there. And so we want to be able to see those and physically check that they're, one, they're still attached, there's no bowing, there's nothing stressing the aluminum, um, the channel brackets are all intact, everything looks good. Flat mode is there, all the wires, nothing's been fraying, everything looks fine here. So we're going to go ahead and just close that up, and voila, we're ready for flight on this side. All right, so now I come to this side of the engine. And what I'm looking for here is you just inspecting the, the integrity of the mounts. Make sure your Lord mounts aren't all cracked or anything to that effect. That the bed mount is all still intact. You can shake the engine. Should see no play. Obviously, it's moving with the plane, so that's good. I also like to inspect my exhaust. Um, since this is a tuned exhaust, you know, any types of cracks in the weld or anything like that could be an issue. So we're just looking at that and making sure everything's still attached and secured, and it is. 
as well as any of my coolant hoses because this is a water cooled engine we are depending on that coolant reaching the engine and we want to make sure there's no leaks or anything that it looks like it might be coming apart so everything looks fine on this side of the of the engine so we're going to go ahead and move around to the tail so as i come over here once again i'm inspecting all the hardware i want to make sure everything is, is uh, nothing's loose nothing's starting to corrode or come apart all of this is exposed one for your viewing pleasure but also um, because it, is, it makes it easier to inspect so water can't touch this um, and we want to make sure that it doesn't prolong any type of uh, damage so we're looking at that and everything looks great it's cadmium plated and it still looks good so that's a plus we'll come down here and i like to get under here physically because you want to check your boom tube to make sure that there's no uh, damage from the tail wheel hard landings anybody that might have been flying this aircraft other than me and we check up here and make sure everything's still sealed and it looks good and it does and what is this here again the splash guard yeah so this What's is What's the purpose of that the splash guard prevents any water from coming up and over your tail wheel which can add induced drag and take you a little longer to get off the water and it also stretches out your tail wheel cables so this this the water hits this folds it up and deflects the water down instead of over your tail wheel we're just checking our controls again, cotter pins, everything's installed. Feels sturdy, there's no play. Both guide wires are nice and taunt. The elevator has full play, or full range of motion, I should say. So everything moves freely. See, nothing binding, no, no weird sounds. Trim tab, same concept. We'll come right over here, and the connecting point, we use this little turn screw thing, so we wanna make sure that's tight. This is bent up in the event that that does fail, it doesn't pull through. So trim tab is nice and secure. There's no play in either in any of the rivets or the the uh, steel wire right there as well. So this is good to go. Come up here. I want to make sure that this jam nut's still tight. My cotter pin's installed. That everything on the control horn for my cable or for the uh, push pull for the elevator is connected, and it moves freely and it does. So everything looks good there as well. Rudder, same concept. Coming down. Cotter pins are installed. Trim tab doesn't have any play in reference to the rudder, and the rudder moves freely. So. Same on this side, guide wires are taunt. No excess play there. Coming around, everything looks good. Now we make our way over to this side of the engine. In this side of the engine, we have a lot more electrical going on. So we have our contacts for both the alternator as well as the starter um, and any wires. We wanna make sure that you know, they have obviously, um, what do you call that, stress relief or strain relief. So they, they should be fairly loose. They shouldn't be all stiff and nothing to that effect. So and it is, so this is good. Uh, we check all of this, make sure it still has, you know, life inside the rubber and all of that, and everything looks good. Your air filter doesn't look too dirty, and everything's still connected the way it should be. So I'm happy here, and we already shook the other side, so we know lower mounts and everything else is good. Everything doesn't, nothing has play. Flap, no play there. Feels nice and stiff. Over to the aileron. We'll physically move that. We'll check the hardware. Once again, there's no binding. There's no weird noises. Shouldn't hear any play, both will move, so that's a plus. <laughs> Come over to the end of the wing, Once again we'll lift the wing, shake the airplane, everything moves in unison. I'm not feeling any play, the wing's not moving independent of the airframe, that would be a significant problem. So now we're checking all the hardware again, it looks good, everything's attached. And then we'll come down and inspect the wheel on this side. So we have our spindle housing, no cracks in the welds, nothing, everything looks good. And our brake looks good too. We got the safety wire still connected all the way around. And uh, this plane does have really good braking, which is a nice plus. And then I'll come over here and do the same thing that we did on the inside. Just inspect all the way front and back, and everything's attached and no fraying. So, how do you get in and out of this beast? All right, so this is actually a fairly simple process. This aircraft has doors on it. Normally, um, in, in about 99% of the weather that I like to fly in, I don't use the doors. Uh, this is more for, this aircraft is equipped with a heater, so the doors just make sense for people that are up north or anywhere else. So this door, basically, you would just fold over. We have a little bit of a breeze, so I'm gonna hold it up. And then I throw my first leg over. Now this gives me the ability to sit on this and have a place to place myself while I leverage anything else I have within my grasp to get in. Now you can pull on anything in here. There's no weak point. I mean, you can pull on this if you want to. You can push on this. You can even put your hand here on the bulkhead. The only difference is now I'm having to hold the door, so I'm gonna go ahead and bring use this strut and bring my other leg in. So once I'm in, I move my butt off that shelf and I just slide right into the seat. So this is it. Now at this point, I can let the door down because I'm inside the plane. And then I'll get situated with both my seat belt and then check everything else that I have to in here. 
All right, so once inside the plane, there's a couple of things that are a little bit unique to this aircraft, being that it is a seaplane and a retract, and uh, just different configuration. So give us a tour. Sure, so um, this is a very simple um, aircraft to operate, as well as being the engine's uh, fuel-injected computer controlled. There's minimalistic from a buttons and switch standpoint. We have our master here. This allows power to go to our panel. In this case, we would actually have our iPad attached in the mountain here, and that would give us our redundancy for the Garmin G5 on the wing bug side, as well as the ability to record the flight data. So everything turns on like we want. We have our avionics on. We have our G5 on. We have all of our um, instruments over here indicating, see, as we flew this aircraft this morning, it's still holding oil uh, fuel pressure, so it's still got 40 PSI on the line. Our fuel's half, which we physically check um, and verify which the tank is right between the seats. Uh, we have our intercom and then of course we have the remaining uh, switches here. So we have our fuel pump, you can hear that engage and they both turn on. So the red is for the, is the secondary, is emergency backup. We have our bilge pump, you can hear that as well. And then you have your alternator switch. Now this won't actually do anything until the aircraft's running, in which case we'll have alternator power going to charge our battery and we can see that via the voltage. This is our throttle. So right here we have our brakes right on the throttle. Those feel nice and nice and tight, uh, which is what we want. If we have any sponginess here or more play, that would indicate we need to bleed the brakes. Um, so if you leave the parking brake on too long, it is possible for that pressure to uh, go down and then you would end up with a lot more um, play here and you'd want to bleed your brakes. So no need for differential braking on this design? No, no need. This aircraft is extremely stable. It has a very low, um, Low, the, the wheelbase is seven feet wide and is very low to the ground, so that gives us a very nice stable platform to ride on. The differential braking is uh, it's, it's nice if you have to turn real, real tight, but for the most part, it's, uh, it's not needed. And then you have your throttle. You want to make sure there's no binding there, that you have full range of motion, and we do. It feels good. Um, so that works, and you want to make sure you bring it back to the stop so that when you start it, you don't go taking off. <laughs> and this is retractable, so where's the controls for that? On this airplane. Yeah, so great question. So this has electric flaps also, which is right here, and we can actuate those if we wanted to. Um, as you see, they come down and then go up. And it has its own limit switch, so it'll stop when it's all the way up and all the way down as well. Um, but right here is our gear, so we want to turn our gear up in the up position, and then that will send power to the motor. Well, it actually won't until we hit the gear lock release, which is this lever right here. And all we do is pull that back, and it releases our gear locks. Once that happens, it knows it tells a sense of power to the motor because it knows that, oh, the gear locks are out of the way, the gear can move freely, and then the motor actuates the gear, in which case the gear will come up. You can't do it on the ground, even if you tried, because all you would end up doing is pulling, stretching out the cable and probably snapping it. There's too much force on the gear right now because the entire aircraft weights on it. So it's kind of a safety measure. I could flip the switch up and the gear won't move, as you see, okay. until I move this. Now, this won't move because of all the weight on the aircraft. Um, without it being in the air. So we have a, a that's kind of a built-in safety feature there. And being that this aircraft is kind of open cockpit in the view, it's unique that the gear is right outside your window so you can you see easily right check. There. Yes, sir. Up or down. Alex, somebody gets into this type of aircraft, uh, obviously this is considered EAB, experimental or, uh, or light sport because of the weight it classifies as light sport. So what type of train is involved in transition or just a new pilot into this in general for train into this aircraft? Sure, um, so we receive pilots from all walks of life, commercial, on down to the sport license, and um, all of them I would highly recommend getting transition training because it is so different. Uh, and this aircraft, one, lands on water, which throws a lot of people off for something they're used to flying, which is normally airport to airport. But this is also a tailwheel and a pusher. Um, and it has it's a high lift high drag type of uh, setup on the wing so with all of those variables we want to have we want people to be safe so we give them a, usually about 10 hours is the average right now for transition training um, and that gives them the ability to safely operate the aircraft um, and the rest of it they'll dial in as they get it more and more experienced and figure out but it's a very docile aircraft we just want to make sure that they're they're not surprised by some of the uh, differences between this and let's say a standard 172. So you don't need necessarily, a, you need a tailwheel endorsement, but that's part of the transition training. Correct. But you do not need a seaplane rating, you just need a sort of a type. Correct. And it, I don't uh, discourage getting a seaplane rating. Um, the seaplane rating teaches you a lot about confined areas, uh, glassy water, things like that, that do transition into this type of flying. However, with this specifically, there are some differences in terms of how we, where the stick's position, porpoising, how to correct for that, um, and landing on a hull versus a float plane. So with this we do what's called an amphib sign off or an endorsement and it's a dual CFI process. So one of our CFIs will go out flying with you, train you, teach you and then recommend you to the other CFI and he 
will go out with you, obviously not knowing you, uh, to deem your proficiency, whether or not you've, you've got a handle on it, and you'll have to prove that. And once you do, we sign you off saying that, yes, you are legal to fly the Aventura 2, and you've been properly trained in it. And that doesn't mean you can get out of this and go into, let's say, a cub on floats, but it does give you the ability to legally and, and safely operate this type of aircraft. Where is the fuel located in this aircraft? So the fuel tank is right between the seats, right under actually your luggage deck, which is this right here. So you can physically turn and look and see where your fuel level is at. And in this case, we're about a quarter tank. Um, and given this is a 23 gallon tank, and we are at a down angle being that it is sloped back because it's a tail wheel aircraft, we probably realistically have about half a tank. Um, so if I turn on my master, I'll be able to see, yep, it's right at half. So this has given us a halfway mark indication, meaning we have right now somewhere right around 11 gallons of fuel and we burn close to let's just say five gallons an hour so we easily have two hours worth of time uh, based on the fuel we have in the tank so good hour of flying with your reserve and you're safe what does this aircraft uh, what's the distance needed to take off on on water and then also on land so as i mentioned before this is our high performance version so this has a lot of get up and go and oomph um, however standard Standard numbers are pretty much about 250 feet on land. It, this thing's off off the ground, um, so it doesn't take long. Uh, we like to uh, we like to ease in the throttle on the on the ground, and that's simply because it's a pusher and and a tail wheel. So you have your thrust behind your center of gravity, and you really want to be able to help control that, and that's by just easing in the power. This has plenty of power to take off at half throttle even. So we just ease that in and go. So 200 feet off la off land, 250 feet off of land, and uh, you're looking about 300 feet on the water um, if you're conservative. So. Thanks for giving us a tour of the uh, the Aventura and give us more information about the, the kit and what's available. I appreciate uh, you giving us the tour. No problem, Ryan. Thank you for coming.